All right, David. Well, first, just wanted to say thank you for letting me into your home and uh, giving me the time. It's great to meet you and welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Uh, delighted to talk to you. Same. I know we were talking just before we were pressed record about kind of the, the rough outline of what we wanted to talk about. And I, I would love to get you to give you an opportunity to speak about the, the history, maybe just in your lifetime that you have seen related to your field of expertise, which is evolutionary psychology. How did it start? Where did it start? How the hell did you get interested in this in the first place? <laughs> okay, that's a that's a great question. Uh, and uh, but making me feel a little little bit old I mean, in your life, you know. Also, all the back in the 18th century. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, well, very briefly. Um, uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I became interested in psychology. And what I was really interested in was human nature. You know, what makes people tick? What causes people to get out of bed in the morning? What motivates people to do the things that they do? And so I thought that psychology had the answers to that mm. and could provide a theory of human nature uh, or insights into human nature. And so I went to graduate school at uh, UC Berkeley in psychology and personality psychology because I thought that the field of personality psychology dealt with the big theories of human nature, like Freud and Jung and Rogers and all, all these uh, grand theories of personality. Uh, but what I, uh, what I discovered very quickly was that um, all these theories had elements that had intuitive appeal or certain elements of them had intuitive appeal, but they all lacked a scientific foundation in the sense of like, well, what is what is a fundamental science on which we can build a theory of human nature? And so that's why over time I was drawn more and more to evolutionary biology. There was no such thing as evolutionary psychology at the time. And so I started reading, even though I had no training in it, and literally had never taken a course in evolutionary biology. I started doing a lot of reading in evolutionary biology, starting in graduate school. And then um, and then I got my PhD in mainstream personality psychology. I got a job at Harvard, which was very fortunate for me because Harvard uh, basically leaves you alone. You know, they don't <laughs> here. Here are the keys. You know, here's where the Xerox machine is. Um, you're on your own and, you know, check back with us some other time. So I had for the first time the total freedom to explore what I wanted to explore. And so I did two things. One is I I took over a course on human motivation that was originally previously taught by a guy named David McClelland, who was a very famous personality psychologist. And I organized the course around an evolutionary framework. That was kind of the meta-theoretical framework. Uh, and while simultaneously doing a lot of reading in evolutionary biology, and the more and then I also started designing studies of couples. My first study I designed at Harvard was a study of married couples. And I, as I was designing this, uh, I thought that I could actually use that study to test some evolutionary hypotheses that had been floated in the literature that I'd been reading about. And so, and so that's really the first um, project that I got involved in. And it was, um, it was a project on mate preferences and ultimately led to my uh, 37 culture study of what men and women want in a long-term mate. Uh, and, uh, because I realized people originally people wouldn't um, wouldn't believe results coming out of a sample of a hundred Cambridge, Massachusetts couples, you know. But so I thought I really have to demonstrate this not just for the field, but for my own satisfaction. And um, and, and many evolutionary hypotheses require demonstrations of universality. So if you just find it in, you know, what are now called weird uh, Western educated cultures, uh, no one's going to believe you, you know, but do, do these do these findings hold up if you go to other cultures? So, uh, but as it happened, and this is why I say the Harvard connection turned out to be very beneficial because at the time there was a graduate student in psychology named Lita Cosmides, and she was married. I don't know if they were married at the time, but her long-term mate, subsequently husband, John Tooby, he was a graduate student in uh, bioanthro. And she heard that I was teaching a course organized around evolutionary theory. And mm -hmm. so that was a key interest of theirs. And they hadn't published anything on evolutionary psychology yet, but we became friends. And then I started corresponding with the very few people around the world who 
were doing anything evolutionary. And so that was kind of the start of it. And, and so my first papers were really about mating. And, and this was a very fortunate, um, fortunate thing to get into. And I'm not quite sure what, how I stumbled into it, but it turned out to be a very fruitful thing and theoretically important, you know, because from an evolutionary perspective in sexually reproducing species, everything has to go through mating. You know, you, you're, you, you don't mate, you don't reproduce. And so, uh, and so what we expect is if there are features of our evolved psychology, they have to be oriented around two big classes of things, survival and mating, hmm. you know, or mating related things. Now, of course, it's considerably more complex than that. But, uh, but as it turned out, mating was a very good topic to um, stumble into or, or, you know, get into. And it started out kind of as a sideline. So, so then uh, in terms of the, the origin of the field, so I, I started becoming friends with the very few people who are working in this area. Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, as I mentioned, she was working on uh, cheater detection and social exchange, although she didn't publish it. Her first, that was, uh, I think, her first paper. Uh, I think that was her doctoral dissertation, 1985, but her first actual publication on it was not till 1989. Hmm. Uh, and so... So there really wasn't anyone doing this stuff except for a couple weirdos, you know, like <laughs> us. So, uh, but um, but of course, Lita and John were extraordinarily uh, brilliant uh, uh, theoreticians and scientists, and so um, and so that friendship was very important. So, um, fast forward a few years. So I was at Harvard for four years, and then Michigan offered me a job, and so I shifted to Michigan which also had a very strong evolutionary community. But then I got invited to be at the Center for Advanced Study Studies at, out at Stanford. Hmm. Uh, and it's, a, it's one of these elected kind of things you don't have control over. You can't say, hey, I'd like to spend a year there. But for some reason, I got elected to be a, a member. And you have the opportunity to, uh, to organize a, a special project if you want and propose it. And that would involve inviting some people to be there with you at the center for like a core, like focus group. And so I proposed foundations for evolutionary psychology and invited, you know, I wanted to invite Lita, Cosmes, John Tooby, Martin Daly, Margo Wilson, and Don Simons, who I wanted to invite, but turned out uh, that didn't work out. Hmm. And so that happened 1989, the five of us were out there and we were going to write a book you know, that was basically going to be called something like Foundations for Evolutionary Psychology. But if you know anything about academics, it's, it's, like, it's like the cliche of herding cats, you know, extremely difficult to do. Yeah. So, and I would, uh, I'm not a bad herder. Um, so like I even had, this was, there was an earthquake in the San Francisco area. You probably weren't even born at this time. but I know what you're talking about, yeah. But it was 1989, yeah. I think, uh, the big earthquake, the Bay Bridge, you know, sure. got totally knocked out. And uh, and so there's this earthquake hits. We're in the me middle of our evolutionary foundations meeting and uh, everyone gets nervous. And I say, no, we must go on. And so we go on for another 10 minutes or so. And then there's a big aftershock. And then John says, I think I ripped we better stop. I'm getting nervous about my apartment. So, so we finally stopped. And so the, the joke is that I kind of lashed them into working through the earthquake, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but at any rate, that book, uh, would never, never came to fruition, even though like we all wrote drafts of chapters and everything. But so eventually I decided I just had to do it myself. Um, and so I wrote what became the first textbook in evolutionary psychology, evolutionary psychology, I grandiosely titled it the new science of the mind subtitle, but I think that is, uh, was, and is appropriate. So, um, let, me, let me ask you there. I mean, did yeah. you, when you began this work with your former colleagues and, and then eventually which led to the textbook, did you have the sense that you were hitting on something big, that this was the a precipice or a potential precipice for a vast new potential source of insight and knowledge? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I, um, uh, I, st I started out, so just to backtrack one minute here. Please. So my training at Berkeley 
was very empirical. So Berkeley came out of this strong empirical tradition. So basically, and psychology tends to be like that. So it is not very strong theoretically, but it's very strong empirically. So mm -hmm. whatever to convince someone, you have to just show the hard hand of data is what decides everything. And so I had that very strong empirical training, which is what partly led me to do, you know, large cross-cultural studies. Um, but at the time I didn't, uh, I didn't realize the full scope of evolutionary psychology. And then over time, partly as a result of this, my friendship with Lita and John, and partly as a result of a gradual growing community, I realized that evolutionary psychology was the foundation for all of, not only all of psychology, and this is going to sound preposterously grandiose, but actually all the social sciences. Hmm. So economics, economic behavior is human behavior and has to have its foundation in our evolved psychology. Uh, and, and of course, psychology now has partly moved into economics. So you have the whole field of behavioral sure. economics. Um, and, uh, but, um, uh, but so, yeah, so, uh, but, but yeah, back to your question, did I realize the, that it was the foundation for everything that humans do? Um, probably not as much as I do now. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but I had some glimmering and came to believe that it, that there really aren't any other alternatives, you know, because there's no other causal process that we know about other than evolutionary processes that can create complex organic machinery, like our complex brain and the psychological mechanisms that it houses. Yeah. For people that are unfamiliar with the phrase evolutionary psychology, or just, just briefly, I, I think maybe it would be helpful to have a, a quick explanation of what those two words mean. Um, if you could just shed some light on on the basics of what evolutionary psychology is essentially trying to get at. Sure. Uh, so uh, a little bit of background Please. for that. So the field of psychology historically has been, until evolutionary psychology basically, has been a functional mm. that is that is it hasn't asked the question what are our underlying psychological mechanisms designed to do what what are they what problems are they designed to solve and so uh so one of the th so so evolutionary psychology is taking evolutionary principles evolution by natural and sexual selection in particular and using that evolutionary lens to examine the human mind uh, the components of the human mind, that is the underlying psychological mechanisms, which are housed in the brain, and their functions. So, you know, um, that is, you know, our, the fact that we have, uh, as infants, we, we, we grow up and we have a fear, fears and phobias. So we develop, as infants, fears of snakes, darkness, spiders, strangers, hmm hostile forces and heights, uh, things that historically damaged our survival. I mean, strangers could be hazardous to your health. Sure. Um, and these are innate. Yeah. Well, so I, so I actually don't like the term in, innate, um, simply because, uh, uh, all we have is our evolved psychology. There's no such thing as a non-evolved psychology. All we have is our evolved psychology. So the key question is, well, what is the nature of that psychology? How is it designed? And the reason that I don't like the term innate is because it has a lot of baggage associated with it. That is, people think that somehow it should be present at birth. And some things are. But even things like stranger anxiety is not present at birth. Yeah. It doesn't occur. It doesn't come online until people start to locomote. Uh, breasts in females aren't present at birth, functional breasts, um, you know, so the, things come online at different points in development. Um, and so, uh, and so developmental psychologists in particular confuse the term innate with present at birth. And that's not really what it means. It's like, even just to take a, a slightly more distant example, well, in, in my domain mating, so our, our full, e blast of mating adaptations don't come online when we're born. Yeah. They don't come online in, in when you're in elementary school. They All of a sudden you hit puberty and 
all of a sudden there's a new world opened yeah. up to you, a new set of attractions and so forth. And then even down the line there, when you become a parent, a different set of adaptations come online that you didn't even know were there. Mm. You know, people find themselves from an, a, a Martian perspective, it would seem irrational. This parent seems like irrationally in love with and devoted to this blob of an infant, uh, <laughs> but it happens to be theirs. They're not in love with the next door neighbor's infant. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, so, and, and the other, the other reason that I'm now that I'm rambling that I don't like the term innate is simply because it has connotations of um, immutability or insensitivity to environmental input. Mm. Whereas many of our psychological adaptations, and we can get into examples when it comes to mating. Uh, are exquisitely sensitive to environmental input. So just to take one example within my domain, uh, mate value. So you're not born knowing whether you're a, a six, an eight, or a ten. Yeah. You know, but you get invite, you get feedback. You know, people are some people are attracted to you. Other people find you repulsive. Yeah. Um, from you range from being an, an incel and in, involuntarily celibate all the way up to being I, I don't know. Um, uh, a rock star who every woman in the world wants to sleep with yeah. or well, not every you, but you get, you get the point. You get the point. So we, we get in this case, social feedback that then calibrates our self perception of our mate value. And, and so many of our adaptations are like that, that require input from the world input from the social environment to be calibrated and then implemented successfully. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating stuff. I said this to you before we started recording that I, to me, this is one of, if not the most fascinating realm of academic inquiry. If you're interested in humans, I don't know how you couldn't be interested in the subject to get back to the history. You were talking about you and the weirdos who were getting together and getting to their conferences and talking about these subjects, but you were the weirdo that wrote the book or wrote the first book. Tell me about that process, what you were uncovering, how that experience was for you. Well, uh, writing the evolutionary psych textbook, it was a, a wonderful, intellectually a growthful experience. So because um, psychologists tend to, and, and I was more or less the same way, I, I was, I've always been, have very broad interests, but nonetheless, people specialize and you study, you know, your small area of expertise. And what the textbook forced me to do was to deeply explore topics that I didn't have much knowledge of. Mm. So for example, the evolution of cooperation, you know, which, which is a huge field now within evolutionary psychology it was a smaller field when I wrote the textbook. Um, the evolution of status hierarchies, you know, that humans evolved in, in groups, all groups contain status hierarchies, position in a status hierarchy is critical in determining your access to reproductively relevant resources. And so we must have a large suite of adaptations that involve motivation to get ahead, dealing with being in a subordinate position or a superior position or a peer position, dealing with rivals who are, you know, competing with us for the same position. Um, kinship is another domain. I never studied anything about kinship, but, but we evolved in uh, small groups where our genetic relatives were uh, a key part of our social environment. Yep. And so we should also have a very rich kin psychology. Uh, and again, very little was known, but there were some things that were known that were very kind of cool that, for example, one of my favorites back then, uh, which I still think is cool is the, the burning building study yeah. that, uh, Eugene Bernstein did. So it's like a building is on fire. You have time to rush in and save one person, but only one, uh, who are you going to save? And there's in there is your your sister, your female friend, your first cousin, your whatever. And they, they did these hypothetical experiments. Of course, ideally you'd, li you'd like to put people in burning buildings to see who people <laughs> would rush in to save. But but these these uh, studies revealed that, for example, genetic relatedness was a very important predictor of who people chose to save. You know and. Um, you know, and there were more complexities than that. But the key point that I'm making in answer to your question is that it really opened up kind of intellectual vistas that I that I was didn't know about. And also that there were 
theories in some of these areas anchored in evolutionary theory that had nothing to do with humans, but could be applied to the study of humans. Yeah. You were saying earlier, I mean, it, it is as though you, you were, you know, speaking about the word innate and how you're not a fan of that word and how at certain points in human life, things come online. It strikes me that it's almost as though the insights about human nature are coming online in your brain perhaps for the first time in some areas, or at least being compiled for the first time systematically, put into this book. That must have been a rather riveting experience for you, I, I must imagine. It, it was, it was. And, uh, and as I said, it was, a, it was a period of great intellectual growth uh, for, for me personally. I mean, very few people um, have that opportunity to cast a net so widely. Yeah. I'd be curious to know as you're going through your own growth there, and I know it's, it's a, it's a big book, so we can't necessarily cover all the topics, but what is the story that is beginning, beginning to get unfolded or is being unfolded as you're doing the research that either was going against the traditional narrative of human nature or human psychology? What are you discovering in terms of like the major themes that are worthwhile for you to be interested in and for the public to know about? Um, that's a great question. Uh, it's a big question. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll pick out a couple and then maybe you can direct me sure. if you think I'm going off track on this. So um, one has to do with fundamental assumptions about the human mind. Um, and, and this gets back to, you know, the notion that all we have is our evolved psychology. So uh, but the, but the critical question is what is the nature of that evolved psychology? Yeah. So if you go to behaviorism, you have B.F. Skinner and Pavlov, so the behaviorists, they believed that these principles of learning evolved, so they weren't they didn't come out of magic. Mm. But the nature of those mechanisms is that they were basically blank slate, yeah. uh, totally domain general mechanism, and that's why. Skinner could study pigeons or rats or whatever. It didn't really matter what the organism was. They came in with essentially a blank slate. Um, and on that slate were written either through processes of learning or if you're a Bandurian social learning, observational learning. And just for people, just to, just to specify something for, for people who are not familiar with the blank slate theory, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, the, the general idea there is that essentially... And an organism is fully influenced by their environment and conditioning, that there is no, no nature that they're uh, is sort of baked into the cake at the time of birth. Right. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's fair. And, and, um, and even I think a, a, a cursory knowledge of evolutionary theory would tell you that that notion can't be correct yep. um, because there are some, adaptive problems that are too important to be learned about, so to speak. Um, you know, that is, you know, you can't wait till um, a tiger or attacks you or a stranger or you fall off a cliff to learn, oh, no, I actually shouldn't be, you know, walking near sh steep cliff. There's some things that are, are too important. And, and I think mating is, is the same way. I mean, you can't say, okay, well, I'm going to rely on my parents and peer group to tell me who I should mate with, you know, we have fundamentally evolved attraction mechanisms that are very much like uh, food preferences. Hmm. So we have evolved food preferences for sugar, fat, salt, and protein, um, and we and um, and we have evolved mate preferences for other qualities, depending on whether you're going for a short-term or long-term mate, whether you're male or female, etc. But so, so, so the, in answer to your question though, so, so one issue is, well, what is the nature of the mechanisms? Are they blank slate, totally domain general, or, or does the human mind contain more specialized adaptations that are designed to solve very specific problems mm. or adaptive challenges? And evolutionary psychologists come down heavily on the second view, although there's still debate about, you know, how, how general or specific they are, which is perfectly fine. It's a legitimate uh, and healthy scientific debate to have. But the other thing, the other answer to your question, I would say is that psychology has had this historically, this fundamental belief that all the good stuff, to the degree there's good stuff 
is in part of human nature and all the bad stuff, all the bad stuff humans do yeah. is due to bad parents, bad cultures, bad environments, poverty or whatever. And so, and so the, no, the notion that we could have evolved to do some bad stuff uh, is uh, anathema to some, some people. And it, and it does violate their, a core, I think, a core belief that, that some people have about human nature. Uh, and especially in American culture, that is that we, we believe in the sort of infinite perfectibility. And, and there was this view, and I, I don't know how prevalent it is, but if you just leave children alone, they will blossom into wonderful flowers that will be cooperative and altruistic and all that. Now, I may be a little bit um, atypical as an evolutionary psychologist in that I'm, I tend to be fascinated by the darker sides of human yeah. nature. So, um, you know, my new book is, deals with sexual harassment, stalking, intimate partner violence, sexual coercion. And I also wrote a book about murder, you know, yeah. why people kill. And so I tend to be drawn to this, but not everybody is. I mean, there's a, a huge literature on the evolution of cooperation, on the evolution of altruism, on, you know, group level uh, uh, cooperation, on cultural evolution. There are many fascinating domains of inquiry. And I think that that's, that's good and, and accurate in the sense that um, it is not the case that all the bad stuff people do comes from the outside and all the good stuff kind of comes from the internal flower blooming. Yep. We have the capacity for good and evil, for doing the nastiest stuff, like, for example, um, warfare. Mm -hmm. I think we have evolved warfare adaptations that cause men to want to go out and form a coalition and kill another group. Uh, and then, but we also have adaptations for altruism for being for generosity for bestowing benefits on other people and which adaptations get activated are are very context dependent hmm. and in in predictable ways and so you can have like a, a right now one of the most uh, among the most peaceful cultures on earth are the scandinavian cultures so norway sweden denmark for example um but you go back 400 years, there were Vikings that were raiding, you know, the UK and Ireland and killing the men and capturing the women. That was merely 400 years ago. And so does that mean that fundamental human nature changed? No, I don't think fundamental human nature changed, but the expression, some adapta warfare adaptations are no longer activated, yep. um, which is a good thing. Uh, yeah, I want to I want to go back to you writing the book and and uh, what the epiphanies were for you or the things that were coming online in your mind that were revelatory in changing misnomers or just enlightening you about conclusions that you thought you had really hit on that shed uh, rather conclusive light on elements of human nature that either had never been discovered before or had never been encouraged to be spoken about that, that you were rather confident were true about us as a species. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I, I would <clears throat> um, point to a couple, but one big one would be uh, sex differences. Yeah. So evolve sex differences. So, so maybe let me let's say a few words about, about that. So when I was in graduate school, I had four different mentors uh, in part because I, um, when I was an undergraduate, I asked the most successful graduate student I knew, uh, you know, what, what is, what should I do when I go to graduate school? And he, he said, one piece of advice, seek multiple mentors. Hmm. I think it was great advice. So was, I hit the ground. I had four mentors, but one of my mentors was a woman named Jean Block. And she was of the blank slate view very deeply. Hmm. And moreover, she, she wrote articles about sex differences where she argued that it was solely environmental in the sense of like girl parents dress girls in pink and boys in blue. They give boys baseball bats and Tonka trucks and they give girls Barbie dolls. And the, all sex differences are as a result of the sort of differential parental treatment. And she even did a, a science documentary uh, called The Pinks and the Blues mm -hmm. that kind of captures that essence. And, but that view was widespread in the field. If 
there are any sex differences. They're solely due to differential treatment by parents. Um, now, of course, nowadays, I mean, any parent who has a son and a daughter would know um, th that ain't the case. But um, but uh, but it, it, there, there's been um, so, so evolutionary theory provides what I've used the only coherent meta theory of where you see sex differences and where you see similarities. You only expect to see sex differences in domains in which the sexes have faced fundamentally different adaptive problems recurrently over evolutionary history. Hmm. Where they face the same problems, you expect to see similarity between the sexes. And so, like in many domains of survival, both sexes have faced uh, problems of food shortages, of parasites, of predators. And so males and females are very similar in many aspects of their psychology around survival. Where they differ is in the mating domain, centrally. That's the largest domain. Even sex differences, so one of the largest sex differences that people have known about for some time is in aggression. Mm -hmm. It's a physical aggression. Men are just, I mean, even from age three or whatever, boys are more like beat each other up more than girls do physically. Uh, but even that is closely related to mating for reasons that we can get into. But, but this larger point uh, that there are fundamentally evolved sex differences was, um, was, and to some degree still is anathema to, um, people today. So there's in, in the modern environment, we have what some people call sex difference denialism, mm -hmm. where it just, you know, and you even see this in neuroscience, which is just crazy, uh, because the data are very, very clear. The scientific evidence is very clear that male and female brains do differ and, you know, pretending that they don't, or, you know, there's some, um, I think ideologically driven fast footwork to somehow make things look the same. So if you look at a, at a very gross level, you say, well, males and females, they both have two hemispheres in their brains. Yes, they do. Boy, they're, they're similar. They both have a corpus callosum, which communicates to them. Yes, they do. Well, males and females are just the same in the brain. So, um, obviously a conclusion that doesn't follow, uh, but, um, but I think that at this point, the evidence for this meta theory uh, is is just overwhelming, and and I think transformational, and and so it is covered now uh, to various degrees of um, scientific accuracy or ineptness, depending on the writer in all intro to psychology textbooks. Hmm. And the, the big the big differences between the sexes, if we if we want to keep on this, and I think you you stated this that the big the biggest difference is in sex um, is in mating preferences or sexual behavior or sexual preferences. Um, shed some light on that. What what do you what are the big differences and and specific to that one? How how does how do the differences turn out to be? Okay, okay. So the well, that's that's also a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I've devoted a lot of uh, my research career to unpacking that. But so so he, here's here's the th the here's the issue so um sex differences don't emerge until you have sexual reproduction mm. uh we evolved from asexually reproducing species sexual reproduction evolved their estimates vary but let's say 1.3 billion years ago mm. so we have a long a long evolutionary history of being sexual reproducers so in, in sexually reproducing species of which we are one there are two sexes um, sex is defined biologically, not by um, pulling people's pants down and looking at their genitals, which some people think it is, is defined by the size of the sex cells. Hmm. So the gametes. So the big ones are the females, big gametes. If you run into any species, you a biologist will say, look at the size of the gametes. If they have big ones, that's a female. If they have small ones, that's a male. So in our species, uh, males basically have sperm and egg. Hmm. So sperm are uh, basically little packets of DNA with an outboard motor attached to try to get as fast as they can to the, to the target, which is the, which is the nutrient rich egg. If you've ever seen photos, like the egg is like gigantic yeah, yeah. and nutrient rich and, and so forth. And so, so what you see is uh, in sexually reproducing species, this is where it starts, but it doesn't end there. So there is a, uh, 
once you get the evolution of sexual reproduction, the sexes start to diverge. And in our case, what we've evolved is uh, internal female fertilization, um, an obligatory nine-month parental investment that occurs within the woman's body, which is metabolically very expensive and um, costly to the female. Uh, males don't do any of that. Uh, then you have, uh, because fertilization occurs internally, you have an adaptive problem that males have faced, which no woman ever has, which is the problem of paternity uncertainty. Yeah. Men, you know, some cultures use the phrase, uh, mama's baby, papa's maybe, yeah. to capture that. Men can never be sure. Women are always 100% sure that, of their, um, you know, maternity and their, and their child. So, um, so, and then you have, of course, breastfeeding, which is also metabolically expensive. And so what, what, what you have in our species and in, and many sexually reproducing species is you have one sex that's basically not to put too fine a point out of the more valuable sex. Sure. So the high investing, very valuable reproductive resource over which the lower investing sex competes. So this is an oversimplification, but this is basically um, Darwin's theory of sexual selection in its modern form as modified by Trivers or as elaborated upon by, by a biologist, Robert Trivers. Uh, and so what that means, though, is so you have these massive differences in investment, which are mostly obligatory. Uh, and like even breastfeeding occurred for, say, two to four years in most traditional cultures. Uh, and infant would die without it. Um, what you have is to an evolutionary psychologist or biologist, there have to be evolved psychological, strategic, and behavioral strategies that co-evolved with these with these fundamental differences in reproductive biology. Hmm. Um, and so, and so, what that means is that the, for example, uh, males will have adaptations to solve the paternity confidence problem, the paternity uncertainty problem. And they do in, in mate selection, in the emotion of sexual jealousy. Uh, 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 women as the high investing sex will have adaptations to be extremely choosy about who they have sex with because having sex with the wrong, the quote wrong person could result in, getting impregnated by a man who is uh, won't stick around, won't invest, or possibly doesn't have genes for good health or whatever. So yeah. making a bad sexual decision is more costly for women than for men. Yeah. Um, in long-term mating, both sexes are very choosy, of course, because both sexes are investing heavily uh, in the mateship and in subsequent offspring, typically. Yeah. So, so what we have is... Um, I know I'm kind of wandering a little bit here, but but what we have is large sex differences when it comes to short-term mating. So we have things like uh, desire for sexual variety. How many sex partners would you ideally like to have in the next 10 years if you, we could give you your magic wish? Hmm. Well, men and women give different numbers to that. You know, men say, oh, uh, 18. <laughs> uh, women say, oh, one or two, maybe three. Um and uh, some men say a thousand, they were like a thousand, which when I first saw it, we started doing studies on this a long time ago. And some men put a thousand, they were like a thousand. <laughs> I thought this is preposterous. But then you read about some very successful athletes, you know, successful basketball players or whatever. And some of them actually do or rock stars yeah. um, do, do get up to numbers that high. Um, so now when it comes to long term mating, the sexes are more similar to each other. Hmm. Um, because they're both investing heavily in offspring. And so they both men and women want partners who are intelligent, kind, healthy, dependable, you know, a low mutation load. Of course, they don't think in <laughs> weird evolutionary terms like that, but, uh, but that's partly what it is. I mean, so we, we differ in uh, mutation loads. So everybody has you and me. We all have a mutation load. Some people estimate that it's like, Averages about 500 mutations in each individual, but some like might have 1,500, and some only have 200, and and so mutations can basically degrade 
the development of your physical or psychological machinery. It's like kind of throwing sand in the in a machine yeah. so that they can produce asymmetrical development, for example, and people find symmetry attractive in a mate. It's a it's a it's a health hue and a signal of low mutation load. Yeah. I know you mentioned this earlier that the I think one of the one of the pushbacks that I have seen among people that are resistant to some of the conclusions of evolutionary psychology is that there's no way that the conclusions that the field has reached have universal applicability, that these are biased studies, that they're not actually indicating objective reality. You noted earlier that one of the key components, as I understand it, to the research is uh, doing widespread global research, regardless of individual culture, to make the determinations that the field ends up making. Um, I would love for you to talk about how you know what you know and how you feel confident and if, if i'm correct in the brief description about how the research is done maybe there's something to that but uh what why there is the general confidence that it's not just a subjective uh bias subject or bias conclusions that are being re reached by the the field in general yeah okay good excellent question um so a couple of thoughts on that so um, one is that evolutionary psychologists have been at the forefront of doing cross-cultural research. Mm. So I mentioned, I think earlier, I mean, it was one of the first studies that I did is a study of 37 cultures. Mm. So of, of mate preferences. And, and, and I did that precisely for that reason. You don't want to just demonstrate it in an American sample or a Western European sample. But that study had uh, basically... Every major religion, cultural group, political system, um, economic system that you, that you could want, uh, and subsequent to the thirty-seven culture study, the the work, the conclusions that I came to, uh, basically I stopped after doing after thirty-seven. I yeah. kept trying to get one more culture after one more culture. It took me five years to do it, but these these findings have been replicated by independent researchers. And that's really another key criterion. Can people replicate it who don't necessarily um, buy into or originate the hypotheses that you're testing? And the answer to that, and I mean, one of the things that I take some um, pride in or, or, or sense of scientific happiness in is that my work is among the most replicable work in, in the whole field, including evolutionary psychology. So People even like there's a whole group of uh, researchers out of the UK, and uh, that are that try to replicate all these effects. And I would say at least half of them they try to replicate don't replicate. Yeah. But mine replicate, so I'm very happy about that. And you know, and part of that gets back to that Berkeley training in 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 empirical data. You know, and you don't want to go out there as a scientist if you're not confident that you your data are replicable so so that that it was instilled in me in my scientific training very very early on uh so now there there's one other cut one one cut at your question has to do with levels of analysis mm -hmm. and evolutionary psychologists make a distinction between the underlying psychology and its design and its expression and behavior and so if you just looked at behavior, you would you would probably draw wrong conclusions. So for example, you could say, well, let's see, if you go to um, Zimbabwe, um, they are polygynous and they allow men, men to marry multiple wives. If you go to the Zulu tribe in South Africa, they limit the number of wives to four. If you go to the United States or, or most Western European countries, they limit legally number of wives to one. So, well, see, mating is just, it's like infinitely culturally variable. Well, it, it, it's not. So, so you have to look at, well, um, what is the underlying design of our sexual psychology? And part of the underlying design of our sexual psychology for males is desire for sexual variety. Now, if you grow up in a polygynous system, you might try to have multiple wives. If you grow up in America where you're legally prohibited from having multiple wives, well, you might want to get on Tinder and have multiple sexual encounters. 
or you might want to do serial mating, you know, so mate with one person, break up, mate with another person, break up. And that's a very popular strategy mm -hmm. for men who have the mate value to successfully implement that strategy. So, so my point is that, um, uh, is that you have to look, evolutionists generally expect universality at the level of the underlying psychological mechanisms, mm. but not necessarily at their expression and behavior, which can be variable. So let me give you one more example of that that, yeah, that relates to my work and then some, some of my work that's recently been replicated in a very, very uh, non-weird traditional culture. So, uh, so one of the things that I discovered uh, was sex differences in the design of jealousy, mm. where where males tend to focus in very heavily on cues to a partner's sexual infidelity, or cues that might signal that, and that's by hypothesis that was what was predicted because it, it is if your partner has sex with someone else, that is the act that's going to jeopardize your paternity. Yeah, sorry, no problem. Um. Uh. So. So we found this sex difference, and, and women are tend to be more cued into signs of emotional infidelity, signs that their partner's falling in love with another person, uh, signs that their partner's becoming attached to another woman, and these are cues for the long-term diversion of his commitments and resources to, to that other woman. And so we find these sex differences, and they do hold up cross-culturally, so they're replicated in a zillion cultures. But we say, well, what about a really strange, non-traditional culture, like a traditional hunter-gatherer culture? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, uh, Brooke Skelza is her name, recently did a study, and I can't, can't remember this was the, I think it was the Himba um, tribe, where she went and looked at that, found the sex difference there, okay, but found, she. oh yeah, she did a study of 11 different cultures, many of which were these traditional sorts. And what she found is there was some cultural variability, but it had to do with how much men in the culture invested in their offspring. So in cultures where men invested heavily in their offspring, they were especially keyed into the sexual infidelity aspect. Cultures where they weren't so invested, there was a bit of a relaxation of that. Mm -hmm. So she found she replicated the sex difference, but found predictable cultural variability dependent on the amount of male parental investment that they engage in, which is brilliant because one of the things that we want to do is we want to explain cultural variability as well as the universality. Yeah. I have to imagine you are in non-pandemic times, a very popular guy at cocktail parties because this, <laughs> this, this subject strikes at the core of who we are. And you've been in this field now for decades. And I'm curious what to you still stands out as the most fascinating stuff you've learned or the, the conclusions that you're confident we really do know about human nature that are worth spreading and sharing just because they're just so fascinating. Well, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, part of it, uh, cocktail parties, uh, which I very much enjoy, by the way. <laughs> Me too. Um, one of the things that I have um, uh, am glad about is when people find out what I study, which is human mating psychology, um, they uh, I show often show curiosity about their own mating lives, and I've been very pleasantly surprised that people are feel very comfortable and eager to open up about their mating lives yeah. and the problems they're having in their mating lives, or you know, seeking advice about what they should do about their mating lives. And to me, as a scientist, it's a wonderful thing because I can basically, in essence, interview, get, get firsthand glimpse into people's mating psychology just by talking to so many people. Mm -hmm. I do it everywhere. I'm in pre if I'm sitting next to someone on a plane, over the course of the plane trip, they'll be telling me all about their mating lives. Uh, so, uh, so, so I love that aspect of it. And um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, replicable work, there's just so much of it now, uh, I mean, uh, almost all the mating work has been replicable. Yeah. Um, the sex differences are rock solid. Uh, sex differences in mating psychology are rock solid. So even 
Um, I'm not sure if you're, you or your listeners know about this. I mean, there's a replication crisis sure. in psychology, yeah. and there's also discussion about magnitudes of effect. So is this a, a weak effect? Is it a strong effect? And psychologists get very happy if they have a magnitude of effect that is is basically 0.3, mm. which is which is equivalent to three tenths of a standard deviation difference between two groups, say. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the sorts of things that I've published, so in, uh, of the the sex differences in our mating psychology and our sexual psychology, there they start at 0.3 and they go up to 0 0.5, 0 0.8, sometimes over 1.0. So these are, and that's partly why they're so replicable. These aren't small effect sizes. I mean, they're analogous to, they're, they're analogous to sex difference in magnitude. They're analogous to sex differences in upper body strength. Mm. So, um, you know, we are, uh, if you look at, forget about psychology, look at male and female bodies. So uh, one of the biggest sex differences is upper body strength. Yep. Um, uh, and not, not so much leg strength. So males are, you know, stronger in leg strength, but it's especially upper body strength, which is really interesting because it relates to things like warfare and fighting ability mm -hmm. and success in the aggressive confrontations. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and so when, when people do come to you, I, I think part of the reason why people are so interested in this is that it, it, it's at the, you know, mating, dating, long-term relationships this is at the heart of human life yeah. uh and i'd be curious to know when you're having these conversations on airplanes or just throughout your life where you're interviewing people or talking to people ab about it and they seek your counsel you know or i wonder what the the research tends to indicate is worth keeping in mind if someone is in the dating process or is interested in finding a long-term partner what do you tell them yeah, well, that's uh, I can tell them lots of things <laughs> about that because uh, I've I've also studied. I mean, starting with that first Harvard study of married couples, I've studied what leads to breakups, what leads to conflict in relationships, who's likely to cheat on you, you know, in a long term relationship. So I have a lot to say about that. But one of the things uh, I'll tell you one here here's one um, insight that I had through one of these conversations. So I used to, back when I had good knees, I used to play squash, yeah. uh, competitive, competitive, not high level competitive squash, but you know, we'd play, I was on a squash team and we'd go around and, and one of the, um, people that I played with was the woman who was the best squash player in Ann Arbor at, at Michigan. Yeah, she yeah. was on our team and she was married. She had three kids. She was absolutely terrific athlete. And it was wonderful we'd go, we'd go to this other club and they'd see there was a woman on our team and they go oh, shut you know but she would beat 90 percent of these Amazing. guys it was yeah. uh, but anyway so we, we would get to talking and um in between you know matches or after the match and she and she once told me she said uh i think i think my husband might be having an affair so this is another thing people tell you about so uh so i said what oh, her husband is a lawyer I said, well, who I also played squash with. He wasn't as good as she was, but so I, so I knew him. And I said, well, what, what was your, well, why do you think that? And she said, well, I was going through his closet looking for something. And I found this expensive piece of jewelry, like right before Christmas. And I thought, oh, how lovely. He's bought me jewelry for Christmas. So she carefully packaged it up, put it back in the closet. Christmas came and went, no jewelry. Uh, and then there was another, then, then he started, uh, staying late, uh, at work. So he had a lot of legal work to do and he started staying late. But what she noticed is that when he came back from these late stays, he smelled differently, basically smelled of condoms. Hmm. Uh, and, and then she said, so she told me all this and then she says, but I don't, actually don't think he's having an affair. Um, because my husband is the most honest person I know. And when I confronted him with this, he told me he wasn't having an affair. So, so I believe him. Now, one of the things I realized, so this is the self-deception, uh, and the powers of self-deception. So this is a woman, she had three kids, no source of income. Uh, she had a committed husband who was invested in the kids. If she got divorced, it would have been really bad it would have been traumatic for her for the kids especially um going out on the mating market you know kids are a cost not a benefit on the mating market uh 
And I think that what it opened my eyes to was something that I hadn't really realized is the power of self-deception yeah. that she could literally, even though the cues were so apparent and I, I do happen to know her husband and he never said, Oh, I'm hanging a fair, but he was what I know from my scientific studies to have the personality type to be likely to do that. Which is what? Um, high on narcissism. Um, uh, uh, and basically high on w what I talk about in my new book, the dark triad traits. Oh. So narcissism, Machiavellianism, and a little bit of psychopathy. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, um, so I didn't say anything. I didn't say, uh, <laughs> those are pretty strong kids. And she gave me a few more like that before concluding that her husband wasn't in an affair. Yeah. So, but anyway, it was a, kind of an eye opener that people can talk themselves into believing something that is not true, even though the evidence is so apparent. Yeah. The, for people who, let, let's say hypothetically, there are people listening to this who are, are in a stable relationship and are generally happy, right? But everyone in this country knows that a large percentage of people who get married don't make it. And uh, I think it's even worse for people who get married a second time. What what do you think? You mentioned this earlier about change in mate value between couples and and how maybe that may, may have been what you were getting at that it can affect the end result between the couple. But uh, for people who are looking to maintain their relationships, what what is worth keeping in mind uh, if one is interested in uh, trying to maintain that over the long the long haul? Yes. Great, great question. So, well, I guess there are a couple of things. So one of the things that I see, so, so there are people who, who break up. Um, I actually think that it's good that some couples do break up. So for example, people, as you alluded to, people do change over time. So the, if you, and I've seen this some with some of my graduate students, they get married when they're 22 or as undergraduates. And then they change and 10 years later, they're no longer, no longer the same person. Yep. And so a person could be a perfect mate for you at one stage of your life, but not so great at another stage. I actually do talk about this issue in my, in my new book. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I don't think breakup necessarily means that you made a bad mate choice. Yeah. On the flip side of that, there are couples who stay together that uh, live what you, is proverbially called the lives of quiet desperation. Yeah. So they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled, they're just going through the motions, but they don't want to get divorced because they're scared or because of the kids or they don't want to, they don't know what their mate value is if they break up, go on the mating market. And then couples' lives get so uh, entangled that breakups can be extremely costly emotionally, financially, and for kids and for any other way. So, but if you want a, a recipe, I actually have a recipe in the book yeah. <laughs> for mating harmony um, in the in the new book. It's an evolutionary recipe for mating harmony, and it involves uh, 14 components. So I can't go into all of yeah. them now, but I'll just mention a couple. So one is you want to pick someone who's similar in mate value to you. So if you're a six, don't try to lock in an eight. Because the eight is more statistically, our studies and others have found the eight's more likely to dump you, eight's more likely to cheat on you if if you do manage to get them into a relationship. Uh, and the eight might feel entitled to other things um, beyond the mateship. So 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 that's one. Second, you want to mate with someone who has a similar mate value trajectory over time because mm -hmm. because it doesn't remain static. Uh, and you know, people can start out quite well matched on mate value an eight with an eight, but let's say he loses his job or becomes an alcoholic or she becomes a famous actress or people's mate value changes over time with the, the vagaries of life, um, successes, failures, health, injuries, uh, other things. So, mm -hmm. Uh, so you want to, and, and that's a harder task to figure out whether you're on similar mate value trajectories. Um, a third thing is, and this is based on, on my research. I mentioned I was a, trained as a personality psychologist. So in my studies of couples, I always include a lot of personality measures. And I can tell you that some personality characteristics 
are disastrous in a long-term mate. And the one that's most disastrous is emotional instability. Hmm. So it's called different things in literature, neuroticism, emotional instability, um, et cetera. But it's basically one hallmark of that is that we all experience stressful events. And so we get kind of um, uh, knocked out of, out of whack. So we get physiologically distressed uh, or whatever. Um, how quickly you recover from that, how hmm. quickly you return to baseline is a hallmark of emotional stability or instability. So people are emotionally unstable. They experience a stressful event and it, they're, it kills them for 10 days, yeah. you know, or a month, uh, or, you know, it, it, so that it, it knocks them out of baseline for a much longer period of time. And what we found in, in my studies is emotionally unstable people are just very taxing. They, what I call, uh, in, in the new book, I call it relationship load. So, so we have, this is by analogy to mutation load. So we'll have a mutation load, but individuals differ on it. We have a parasite load. So some people have a riddle, a riddle with parasites. Others have a low parasite load. We also have relationship load. Mm. People who are emotionally unstable impose a high relationship load on their partner. And so, um, and it produces a, a lot of stress and a lot of time and effort that get, has to get devoted to dealing with that emotional instability. And that's time and effort that you're not spending doing fun stuff or things that are more deeply rewarding. And so, and so emotional instability, and it is a predictor of divorce. Hmm. Um, what are the symptoms of that, of, of that, uh, of that personality type? Is it just neuroticism, something that could be observed in a person if you hung out with them for a few hours? How do you know somebody possesses that trait? Yeah, yeah you can't, if you have a few hours won't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to see the person over time. What I recommend, and this is what I would recommend, I recommend to people who ask me for mating advice, they say, I'm, I'm, in, I'm dating this woman or man, and I'm thinking about maybe, maybe we should take it to the next level, get a little more serious. I say go on vacation with them. Yeah, you know, go to because on vacation, at least in a lot of vacations, you're ex, you're exposed to novelty, stressful conditions. You know, you're in a different economic currency. You you don't know all the local customs, and you can observe relatively quickly, let's say a week or two, how the person responds to the stresses and strains of these novel environments, and that's usually a test. So if you really do well together on vacation. Um, then that's a good sign that you're going to do well over the long run. If things if the person can't handle it, the a piece of luggage gets lost and they're stressed out for five days, you know, um, you know, you gotta get a roll with the pie. I heard one story. Some woman was telling me that uh, she was with her fiance in this case. They were traveling in Italy and uh, got a flat tire. They'd rented a car and they were like st- and, and they were like stuck in a mud puddle or something like that. And he, this guy was like off the charts, stressed out about it, you know, uh, basically going to panic mode. And she was laughing. Look, we, we got the cell phone we'll call, you know, someone fix the tire, get us out of the mud. You know, it was like no big deal. But that, that event revealed his level in this case of emotional instability, not being able to handle stress. So, yeah. so that's why I say go on vacation, do it early in the, if you're thinking get, about getting serious with someone, go on vacation. How, what role in your judgment does, you know, intuition or feeling, uh, play in the accuracy of being able to, to trust those sort of, you know, sensory experiences as a, as a person in in judging how well you will match with a person you mentioned, uh, you know, I think everyone knows how, important attraction is in just that in getting a relationship off the ground in the first place. But, um, what, what level of appropriateness do you give to emotions, to intuition, to feeling, uh, related to, you know, if, if a couple is actually well matched for one another? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, um, a lot, this isn't something that I've studied, yeah. uh, in my own research program, but I think that people are often right in their kind of gut feeling, uh, and, um, sometimes go against their gut feeling. Um, and it sometimes ends in disaster, but, but I don't know, I don't have empirical data on that. Yeah. So, but 
How my do, intuition is that you should go with your intuitions. <laughs> for you know, there there are also instances of people that I'm I'm familiar with who, you know, break up for a while, grow or change or something happens, get back together, and it actually sometimes works. Um, sometimes it doesn't work either, and people kind of get in this perpetual loop of like breaking up and getting back together. Mm-hmm. What what's your I don't know what's what's your general sense or uh, and you're welcome to you know, hone in on your, your, your specific research that you're an expert in, but what's your general sense of, um, you know, breakups, getting back together, getting divorced, getting back together. Does that ever actually work out in your experience? Yeah. Well, I, I don't, uh, I, uh, again, I resort to the empirical data. I, I haven't seen studies of that. Um, I mean, sometimes it does work. Actually, that that, ha- that happened to my grandmother. Hmm. Uh, my mother's side, they they got she and her partner got divorced, uh, and then they remarried uh, five years later and s- remained together till death parted hmm. them. Hmm. Uh, so, um, what happens in those situations that allows it to work in in the end? Yeah, I don't know. I unfortunately yeah. they're both dead now, yeah, and so yeah. I would have liked to ask them that question, yeah. like, well, why did they break up to be with, and why did they get back together? But um, I think that often, though, the reasons for breakups don't don't necessarily go away. You know, so, I mean, I've seen more cases in my friendships and experience of the, of the latter where people break up, get back together, break up, get back together, and then finally break up. Yeah. Or it doesn't end up working. Yeah. Um, do those tend to be just core personality conflicts that continue to resurface that people, you talked about self-deception earlier. Uh, is that what t- tends to happen in those situations in your experience or, yeah, or something? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. Um, but I don't, I don't have any insight into what causes it to work or not work. Yeah. Let's talk about your book. You were you were mentioning that earlier, and I know it's it's coming out, right? It's not available quite yeah. yet. It's coming out in July. Uh, it, well, April twenty seventh, okay. in the United States, July one in the UK. Okay. Um, what got you interested in the subject of the book? And and talk about it. What what's what's in there? Okay. Uh, well, the title of the book is um, "When Men Behave Badly," and the subtitle is "The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment, and Assault." Uh, and so it basically deals with bad stuff men do. Yeah. Uh, brief bit of background of that. So I've always been interested in conflict between the sexes, uh, just because I've witnessed a lot of it in my life, um, some in my personal life, but also in everybody I know. Um, and uh, even in the studies that I did of couples, I never found a single couple that had no conflict. Yeah. There's always conflict. Yeah. Sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. And how they deal with it matters quite a bit. Uh, But the book is about conflict between the sexes. And what happened was I originally thought when I was started writing the book and outlined it, there would be sort of equal equal ways in which men and women would torture each other. (laughs) Uh, So and 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 that is true to some degree on the on um, like uh, on the on the mating market. So in Internet dating, both men and women post deceptive profiles, deceptive photos that are not accurate. So, but, um, but the more I got into, when I started getting into some of the topics like sexual harassment, stalking, intimate partner violence, and sexual coercion, it became clear that men, the more extreme you got on these aspects of sexual violence is the bigger umbrella term, the more men tended to have a monopoly on being perpetrators and and women being victims of it. And so that's why the book ended up being When Men Behave Badly, because the book, even though it covers some bad stuff women do, it then ended up focusing um, more heavily on the bad stuff men do, because when it comes to sexual violence, men do a lot more bad stuff. Uh, So... um, so and, and then the hidden roots of sexual harassment, deception and assault. I mean, th- this is as it happened, I, I was talking to somebody and they said, boy, your book is really timely because there are all these things in the news now. Yeah, yeah. You know, governor of New York. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, or now there's uh, another uh, you know, politician. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. There's always it seems like 
this was really timely to yeah. look at the hidden roots of you know sexual assault and harassment and all that. But but I think it's always there, you know. So if the book were published a year from now, there'd be a different set of things hitting the news, and one can even ask, well, why is why do people care so much? Why is that such a newsworthy thing? And I think that's revealing of how important these topics are and how the social sciences have not adequately dealt with identifying the causes, you know, and that's why I say the hidden roots of these things, because they are, of course, evolutionary roots. They, they boil down to an examination of the underlying sexual psychology of men and women and how that gets played out in different contexts. And so trying to solve some of these pernicious social problems. And I think, I think sexual violence is a pernicious social problem. Yeah. Um, perhaps the most widespread one in the world that we have to identify the causes. Uh, we have to identify the underlying psychological mechanisms that are at play, the circumstances that activate or inhibit them, the defenses that have evolved to prevent becoming a victim to them. And it's only by this deeper scientific understanding that we'll be able to solve some of these social, social ills. And I think they are social ills. Um, and so in a way, uh, and, and I think social sciences has done a really bad job of that in part because of their model of human nature is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, if for example, you, your belief is that all ills, in the world stem from uh, patriarchy, to use one example, or from bad parenting or something, you're not going to get very, very far because sexual violence occurs in, quote, non-patriarchal cultures. So, so as an example, you go to cultures, uh, countries like, like Denmark, Sweden, Scandinavia, they have very low rates of violence in general, but 30% ballpark, 30% this is what the studies show of women in these Scandinavian countries will experience intimate partner violence. Really? Yeah. At some point during their lives. Yeah. Hmm. 30%. So, and these are not patriarchal cultures. In fact, just the opposite. They're among the most sexually egalitarian hmm. cu cultures in the world. Hmm. And so, so clearly now, you know, do patriarchal institutions have something to do with it? Yes, they do. And I talk about that in my book. But they're not, they're not separate from our evolved psychology. So f as an example, I talk about one of the links between our evolved sexual psychology and these patriarchal institutions. For example, there used to be laws that said that marital rape was not rape. It was literally not rape. And, and if you went to one of these cultures that had this, as we did... Yeah. Um, and they said marital rape, they would say that is what's called an oxymoron. That's illogical concept. There can't be such a thing because by definition, marriage, the woman gives her body freely to the man no matter what. And there's no such thing. Well, now in the United States and in many Western European countries, we have laws against that. But um, who created the laws to begin with that said that, well, rape within marriage is not rape but rape outside of marriage is rape. Well, it was obviously males yeah. who, who created that. Uh, and so th even the laws that have been historically created that are called legitimately patriarchal laws um, are laws that are partly a product of male sexual psychology. Um, and, um, and I go into this in, in some depth in the book when it comes to more modern things like... Um, in our culture, like laws against sexual harassment, uh, where because males and females have different evolved psychology around this, um, fundamentally different. So the same act, the same acts of sexual harassment, men do not perceive those as, as, as sexually harassing as women do, mm -hmm. observing exactly the same actions. Yeah. Uh, and so the reason this matters is because legally there's what's called the reasonable person standard and in, when it comes to sexual harassment or stalking the issue is would a reasonable person judge these to be sexually harassing or judge these to be instances of stalking or induce fear in the victim um, and so in other words these it's a very small subset of laws but they're relevant to sexual violence 
the laws are defined in part by the psychological state of the victim hmm. and or imputed psychological state. But if you apply a reasonable person standard to sexual harassment, then it will result in harms to women if there's a male judge or a male dominated jury that's decided because there is no reasonable generic person. Mm -hmm. There's a reasonable, reasonable men and reasonable women. And so it's an interesting legal issue. And I've talked to legal scholars about this very issue about, well, how do you design a law when this, when the psychological state of the victim is critical for determining whether a crime has been committed, when the male and female differ so profoundly in that psychological state, yeah. you know, and, and I think the, 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 some say, well, maybe we should split the difference or whatever. I don't think that does the trick yeah. because the, again, that would harm, harm women who are the primary victims. Yeah. I'm curious what you think about the field right now. I mean, I, I know that there are other evolutionary psychologists that I'm familiar with that are becoming more public figures. Jeffrey Miller, I think at the university of New Mexico, Gad Sad, who's Canadian, I know is, is also in the field. What, what, what are you, what are the, what's the field generally curious about? What do you, what do you, what do we not yet know that I think that you think is perhaps forthcoming in the coming years that is being investigated? Oh, well, I think that, um, I think there's still a lot of gold to be mined in the mating vein <laughs> yeah. because it is related to everything. I think that we, and I've started studying this, is the psychology, I alluded to this earlier, psychology of um, status, prestige, and reputation hmm. um, because people live and die and kill for their status and reputation, and we know very little about that. So my lab and, and some other labs around the world have started exploring that. I think there's a really rich vein uh, there. Hmm. Uh, I think uh, coalitional psychology is another big area that, and this is one of those areas where there are also going to be huge sex differences because hmm. women, there's no evidence that women ever formed a female coalition to go to war, to attack another female coalition, kill the women and capture the men as husbands. I mean, zero cases, uh, <laughs> but men have done that throughout human history. Yeah. Uh, and so I think males have a fundamentally different coalitional psychology. And, um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's important to understand that even things that are going on currently with respect to things like um, defund the police and some of these l uh, current issues, I think what's happening is male evolved coalitional psychology is getting activated. You know, police are seen as the enemy an opposing coalition, and we need to, we need to vanquish them, mm. defund them, or in some cases, kill them. Mm. And so there's, I think that to solve some of these social problems that are coming up in the world today, we need to understand about our evolved coalitional psychology. Yeah. So I think that's, and there's been very, very little work on that. You were speaking earlier about the uh, the you know, sort of the, the the biggest issues that tend to lead to divorce and how the neurotic, emotionally unstable characteristic is often the death nail for relationships. What are the qualities to look for? What what are the things that you are confident actually, you know, increase the probability of a long term successful relationship with people? Okay, well, uh, great question, and uh, I'll just mention a few. Please. So, so one one is um, similarity of fundamental values. Mm. So, and these could be religious values, uh, or lack of thereof, uh, political orientation. Um, uh, those are, those are the two big ones, even, even a worldview. So similarity of values, because if there's a conflict, they are, let's say a, a conservative and, and a liberal or, or a, a deeply religious person and an atheist, there's going to be fundamental conflict that, that, so, so couples have to be, don't have to be, there are cases where they're not aligned on those things and still have happy marriage, but talking about increased probability of, mm -hmm. um, second, you, you want to also pick someone who's similar to you in intelligence. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if let's say you are in your, I don't know if you're in a long-term relationship, but, uh, if you are too much smarter than the person you're with, uh, or not smart enough for her. Um, then you have difficulty communicating on yeah. the same level. A smarter person has to dumb everything down. The, the, 
you know, more cognitively challenged person has to, is always feeling like they're not getting anything. Yeah. So, so you have to be in the ballpark. S- so similar in intelligence, so you can have interesting conversations. Uh, I think sense of humor is important, yeah. you know, for a long-term relationship, you got to be able to laugh at stuff, <laughs> you know, even like, like I mentioned earlier, like some, you get a flat tire, or there is a tragedy, you got to laugh about it, yeah. you know, and, um, shit happens yeah. another, <laughs> another way of phrasing that yeah. you got to sometimes roll with the punches so someone that's adaptable you know sense a good sense of humor emotional stability i mentioned uh, earlier that's critical um and i guess also aligned on some fundamental life goals yeah. so for example children you know some people are adamant that they never want to have kids and some people want to have two or three, hmm. if there's misalignment there, that's, that's going to be critical. Um, it's also important, maybe less important now, but I still think it's important. But I mentioned earlier that we evolved in small groups where our genetic relatives were often close by. Um, the Having your partner, uh, getting the approval of your kin group or your family, I think is, is, is important. It doesn't necessarily make or break a relationship, but if let's say your friends and your family don't like your partner yeah. or think that they're really a bad match for you, I would listen to that, yeah. that information, uh, because you're not the only judge, especially when people fall in love and you get the sexual passion and, you know, which clouds the brain, uh, yeah. you know, they're getting other people's perspectives could sometimes be valuable. Oh, you, you always have to look at the source. Okay. In other words, don't trust everybody's view. Yeah. There's a, there's a line that I was, I was writing today that I, I love. I think his name is Joseph Tussman, something like that. And it, it, he said, it's something like if, if the pupil is to learn anything, it is that the world will do most of the work for you. And if you try to defy the world, it will teach you a lesson. <laughs> That's uh, good. That's, that's, I'm, I'm butchering that to some degree, but I think the general oh. idea is you were saying earlier, if you're a, if you're a six uh, don't, you know, it would actually probably behoove you if I'm understanding you correctly to kind of get a, to deal with reality, um, to admit reality and that that actually long-term is probably a better strategy if that's kind of what you were getting at. Yeah. 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 Although the, that, that's, that's not always easy to do, but I, yeah, I, you be in part because men in particular, there's evidence that men more than women overestimate their mate value. Yeah. So the man might be a six, but he thinks he's an eight <laughs> or, you know, and gets very angry at the women who are eights that spurn his, um, attention. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, yeah. Listen to the world. No, that's, that's, that's a good insight. Yeah. Um, I, I, you've written, I think, I don't know how many books, but multiple books. What, what, what do you want to spend your time researching now? I mean, you, this publication is coming out here shortly. Are there other subjects that are still deeply interesting to you in the field that you want to pursue over the next many years? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm just getting started. Yeah. Um, but, but um, yeah, so I have actually the, my next few books um, in the queue okay. already. So writing this book, this is actually my first new, new book in, um, a bit over a decade. Uh, so, uh, although I've revised previous books, which I very much enjoy because you can correct all the errors and update things. But, um, but, um, uh, I'll just mention two, one that interests me very deeply is, uh, the topic of morality, Hmm. uh, and, uh, and in particular sexual morality. And it's become the topic of morality has become a huge topic in the field, but almost no one's looking at sexual morality. Hmm. So my lab, uh, this is with a couple of graduate students, uh, former graduate student Kelly Asau and current graduate student Courtney Crosby. We're looking at sexual morality and looking to see whether which elements of sexual morality uh, are cross-culturally universal which are variable across cultures, which shows sex differences. And it's one of these things where you ask the question about sex differences. And I, I ask it, and sometimes it annoys people when I do. I said, have you analyzed your data for sex differences? And half the time, no one's even bothered to look at it. But yeah. sometimes there are really interesting sex differences. And, and we're finding there are in the domain of sexual morality. 
So, uh, so that so that's a long term interest. Um, whether or not it will turn into a book or not, I don't know. Uh, but we're doing um, pretty intense cross cultural research on that. Another is the status, prestige, reputation. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by that, and we've started to publish articles on that. And so, typically, what my pattern is, I'll publish a bunch of articles on a topic, and then if I feel like there is enough there uh, for a book, then I want to write a book because I love writing books and I love reaching a, a wider audience. And in fact, I talk about ethics and morality. I actually think that academics have a moral duty to disseminate their work because we as professors, we are supported by the public. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a professor at the University of Texas. The state of Texas pays part of my salary, right? So why should all that information, the scientific knowledge that I generate, why should it just be spoon fed or not spoon fed, but, but uh, disseminated to a small group of other psychologists who read the, you know, the, the three journals that are, you know, read. I mean, every, everyone in this case in the state of Texas should have access to that knowledge. And so I, I view it as kind of um, a moral obligation to disseminate the scientific work if it's important. Of course, not all work is, you know, important, but I think this work, like on, on sexual violence toward women, I think it's important and important for everyone to know about it. Yeah. So, so those are a couple things, and I have a couple other other books in the in the in the queue. But for for people who are really interested in this subject, who who else are the luminaries that you point to as being like this is a really talented person doing interesting research in the field that you would recommend other people also seek out? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there there are there are a bunch. Um, so here's one one that I would recommend is a former student of mine. Yeah. He's a professor at UC Santa Barbara now. His name is Dan Conroy Beam. Mm. Uh, and he's doing, he, he hasn't written a book yet, but he's doing amazing groundbreaking research on, on human mating. Mm. Um, a second person I would point to is a guy at uh, University of New Mexico in the psych department. Uh, his name is, I'm going to butcher his name, but it's Marco Del, Del Gudici. Mm-hmm. I think is how you pronounce it. Um, I could be butchering that, <laughs> but he's he's another absolutely brilliant evolutionary psychologist. He recently published a book on evolutionary psychopathology, so using an evolutionary lens to look at disorders, hmm. psychological disorders. Absolutely brilliant. Everything he writes is 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 brilliant. So, um, so those are those are two that come to mind uh, immediately on the kind of um, off the charts. You know, these are going to be superstars. Yeah. They're on a, that trajectory. Yeah. I, I would love to know, too, in your own life, just personally, how what you have learned over your career has influenced or changed you. I mean, do you do you feel like the knowledge you have gained over the years has changed your behavior or changed the way you look at people? Anything like that? A- absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I think it's. It certainly changed uh, the way I look at human mating. Yeah. In the sense that I I feel like I more I have X-ray vision into people's mating <laughs> psychology in a way that I didn't, you know, back then, you know, and I can see, you know, just even trivial stuff like, you know, a woman says, um, "Did you see how short her skirt was?" That you know that you know that slut or right. Yeah, yeah. I get, I like, I, I understand I've done studies on derogation of competitors. And so I understand exactly what's going on. Um, mate guarding tactics, you know, um, things. So I feel like I do have more of an x-ray vision into people's mating psychology. Um, I think that, uh, it, it's probably made me more optimistic about human nature. Hmm. So evolutionary psychology, if you just focus on the bad stuff, which I've done a lot of in my career, you can get a pretty jaundiced uh, view of human nature. But the fact that we have adaptations for cooperation and altruism and generosity and uh, and, and really good stuff um, is um, is encouraging to me. Yeah, you know, and that's why. So I have I have uh, not a jaundiced view of human nature, but I guess a, a mixed view. We're a mixed bag. Yeah. 
Um, in in closing here, in, in in winding the conversation down, and I, I'd love to get a, just a, a little bit more information about just mating in general, because I do think it's one of those topics that every living adult human being is is interested in and and likes to glean as much knowledge as possible about the subject. We've talked about the negative traits, the positive traits. Um, I would be curious to get your take on just the institution of marriage in its um, likely in its role, I guess, in the 21st century. You know, it, when I think of evolutionary psychologists, they're and, and I guess in my own generation with millennials that. There's more of a, people are getting married a lot later. There's more openness to different forms of mating, different types of long-term partnerships and open relationships. Um, I don't know that anyone knows what works or what won't work over the long haul, but I would just be curious to get your intuition on the traditional institutions in America and what whether you think they are still relevant and wise for young people who might be listening to this, who are in love, who love their partner, are interested in having kids, but are maybe a little bit skeptical about like the lifetime component to traditional marriage that they may have seen in their parents. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a big, big question yeah. and, a, and a really interesting question. Um, and and I don't have any great insights into the future. I mean, if you're those who try to predict the future on these things are are usually wrong, yeah. uh, or, or bound to be wrong, despite uh, the confidence with which people will make the predictions. <laughs> uh, but um, I think that I think that long term mating is here to stay. So uh, whether we call it you know traditional marriage or not is a different issue but people i think we do have adaptations to form long-term committed relationships uh, of course there are individual differences in that and there are also stages of life issues you know i, I wouldn't encourage a 16 year old or even an 18 year old or maybe even a 20 year old to lock in on their one and only yeah. at that early age i think having more mating experiences is in general a good thing you know, gets you experience and clarifies what what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, I see the proliferation of different mating lifestyles as as a positive thing. Hmm. Um, in that, I don't think there is a one size fits all. You know, and I know that. I mean, for some people, locking into a long term mateship is is the perfect thing. Yeah. Uh, for other people, polyamory seems to work, and I know I know couples who. That, that actually works very well for them. It kind of satisfies desire for sexual variety while at the same time gives them the stability of a you know committed partner. Um, but that wouldn't work for everybody. You know, um, I don't think it wouldn't work for me, for example. Yeah. So my, yeah. my evolved sexual jealousy mechanism would interfere with that lifestyle. Um, some people or really go for short-term mating, you know, yeah. and so get on Tinder and want to have sex with a different person every night or whatever, every week. Um, so I think that I tend to be non-judgmental about different mating lifestyles, yeah. you know, of whatever sort. And, and that includes, you know, obviously homosexual relationships and, you know, whatever, nudist camps, anything whatever people want you know life is short yeah and then you die so you, you, you might as well go with a mating strategy that that suits you suits you and not all not there isn't one size fits all on that yeah. last question i want to ask you is about um you know you've done a lot of these interviews and a lot of you've answered a lot of questions today you've interviewed a lot of questions in past interviews be curious to know if there's anything that you wish you would have been asked that you've never been able to address publicly, or, or if not, if there are subjects or, or misnomers about your field of expertise that you think it's important to correct the record on. Um, well, that's a whole we could talk for an hour about about, sure, yeah, about yeah. Uh, misconceptions, but but yeah, I would say that um, the the biggest misconception is that. An evolutionary perspective leads to the conclusion that we have a, a, a fixed, unalterable, immutable um, uh, nature that cannot be changed in any way and is impervious to eliminating the bad aspects. Uh, I think that um, 
that once people understand the nature of our evolved psychological mechanisms, they will realize how how context specific they are, and in fact that they were designed to deal with different contexts. Now, not all contexts. Um, but um, but just that our evolved psychology is a lot more flexible than people stereotype is when they think about oh it's evolved therefore I can't change it yeah um, I think it's more difficult to change desire than it is to change its expression and behavior hmm. you know so you can just like when you let's say you you want to get fit you want to lose ten pounds it doesn't cause you to not like to eat ice cream or pizza or whatever you like you yeah. still like you still want those things but you in the service of a different goal you choose not to eat those things for a period of time in order to drop the weight and the same is is true of mating you know we we have um you might be in a committed mateship and you have sexual attractions to other people very very common yeah but um whether you express those, whether you say, okay, um, you know, whether you, you might interpret that to mean, oh, I don't love my partner, which some people do, and that's an incorrect inference because yeah. you can have love for your partner and still desire for sexual variety and attraction to other people. Uh, but you might choose not to express that attraction in by having an affair or sleeping with that other person for a variety of reasons. You might want to preserve your mateship or you may feel like it would it would cause a breakup or it would cause damage to your social reputation or a variety of things. So we have at any moment in time, many, many desires, many of which get subjugated to other desires that yeah. are more important to us. Yeah. Well, I love the subject. It's one of my favorites and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the, the time. I know you're a really busy guy and a really productive guy um, I have been looking forward to this conversation for a long time and I wish you all the best. I, I think the field is, it's just, it's, it feels to me like one of those growth areas, like uh, that a lot more people could benefit from knowing about and, and that a lot more people will get interested in. And, um, yeah, I just want to thank you for all of the years of work that you put into evolutionary psychology and um and wish you the best with everything else that is is to come in in your career well well thank you it, it's really it's been a genuine delight to talk to you and uh, obviously you're very intelligent and i appreciate uh, your asking such thoughtful and intelligent questions because that leads to an interesting conversation thank you david i appreciate it so and hope we have another in the future maybe over a beer i would love to thank okay you, cool thank you